So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this statistics seminar. So as usual, it's uh, under uh, the Statistic Across Campuses initiative, but it's a seminar organized at UNSW. Uh, so today we're very pleased to have uh, Roy Tash Chandra. So Roy is a senior lecturer in the School of Maths and Stats here at UNSW. Uh, some is, of his research interests are a Bayesian deep learning, neuroevolution, climate extremes, geoscientific models, mineral exploration. Uh, and today, Roy is going to talk about birth based language models for US elections, COVID 19, and analysis of translations of the Bhagavad Gita. Right? Thanks for accepting the invitation, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Boris, for your uh, kind uh, comments and a nice introduction. So the overview for today's talk, uh, first I'll talk about uh, a bit about language mod modeling with deep learning. And then there are four major uh, topics that I will present. It's kind of, we can think of it as four papers. So I'm trying to squeeze a lot in this uh, one uh, presentation. Um, and the first one would be uh, about uh, Twitter analysis leading to the US uh, 2020 presidential elections, Bert and Biden, and how we think that Twitter analysis, sentiment analysis can help in election modeling in the future. Then sentiment analysis during the rise of COVID-19 in India, uh, cases uh, last year and uh, before or, or while reaching the peak what type of sentiments people were expressing. And then uh, uh, the, the last two are more preliminary results that I will discuss about translations of uh, a study of uh, Hindu texts, such as the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads. So a bit of background in the area, what is sentiment analysis? Basically, it's part of uh, natural language processing, text analysis, computational linguistics, and biometrics. And it uses uh, language models to identify, extract, quantify, and study affective states and the, or the emotions. Sentiment analysis has been used for marketing and advertising, analyzing customer reviews and survey, social media analysis, and applied to various uh, domains, including medicine and public health. And uh, we are basically exposed to sentiment analysis uh, algorithms every day whenever we are using uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, and Facebook, social media apps, whenever we are in Google. Basically, there are bots uh, collecting information on how we are reacting when we are writing comments. And that all is used for um, marketing and advertising so they are bots and those bots are collecting information and they are further fed into ai uh, or language modeling algorithms and that help uh, ma marketing companies and social media to raise uh, their profile so topic modeling is uh, uh, basically used for discovering abstract topics that occur in a collection of documents or text corpus and it is used for text mining and it's used for discovery of hidden semantic structures in a text body. A document typically contains multiple topics in different proportions, hence it is a challenge for natural language processing algorithms and models given ambiguity in expressions. We, we know about this uh, through Twitter and social media. Uh, the big challenge of uh, language models is how do they deal with so fast changing expressions, emojis, emotion expressions, and these days those expressions are going into memes and so on as well. So uh, these are big challenges and uh, there's a lot of ambiguity and due to uh, word limiting, for example, Twitter people express a lot of things in so-called shortcuts uh, and uh, this becomes uh, difficult for language models. And topic, topic and, and modeling can be useful in a lot of uh, applications of social media analysis, such as uh, understanding public behavior during events such as elections and public behavior during pandemics, how people have been expressing, we can understand the psychology uh, of 
the, the population and individual groups as well with uh, topic modeling. And of course, topic modeling again is uh, used for marketing and advertising as well. So uh, one of the key uh, models in the whole uh, neural uh, networks or AI uh, field is recurrent neural networks. So where do we place recurrent neural networks? So if we see artificial intelligence as the root, then under that root comes a, num a number of uh, branches and we can see machine learning as one branch optimization is another branch and there are other branches so under machine learning comes neural networks and under neural networks there are major neural network architectures such as simple canonical or feed forward neural networks and then there's a major group called recurrent neural networks and basically recurrent neural networks are quite prominent in uh, processing temporal sequences in dy dynamical systems and they have been uh, the forefront of language models because of the ability to process uh, time variant information and the dynamics of a change of hidden state activation in a simple recurrent neural network is given by the following equation. Uh, perhaps we go back first to uh, see the figure uh, and here what we see is a very simple uh, one of the uh, key guys uh, who developed a recurrent, simple recurrent neural network was Elman and uh, the other guy was Jordan. So the, an Elman recurrent neural network is sometimes referred as the simple recurrent neural network. And uh, what we see here is a figure where uh, here we see just one input neuron and one hidden layer and one output layer. And uh, there's basically context layer <clears throat> that provides state information to the hidden layer. So if we compare this with a feed forward neural network or a multi-layer perceptron, we will not have this feed for back connections. And the, the major part of recurrent neural network are these feedback connections that help them to uh, model uh, time variant uh, information better than uh, generally than uh, feed forward neural networks. So what we see here is more of a plan view. The, the same uh, neural network, recurrent neural network unfolded in time is, time is given here. So we have, we can see this as more of an elevation view. So what we have this D of one, two or three, you could think of it as T, T of one, two and three. So uh, if you have a univariate time series, basically in a feed forward neural network, if you do windowing, if you, your window size is three, then you will have three input neurons in a feed forward neural network. Whereas in recurrent neural network, you'll just have one input neuron and basically it recurses three time steps, basically. So that is the key part of a recurrent neural network. And uh, recurrent neural networks, I mean, they are uh, visualized differently and there's a major problem is the time uh, steps. If these time steps basically are too large. If they are more than 12 or 15 in uh, some simple applications, then it becomes very difficult to train these uh, neural network architectures. So the, um, that is not the vanishing gradient problem. And this was uh, known in the early 90s. And uh, because the problem is a uh, major algorithm that is used to train uh, feed forward and recurrent neural network is back propagation. And the algorithm that is specifically for recurrent neural network is back propagation through time. And back propagation through time basically fails when your time legs given here are more than 10 or 15 for most applications. So hence that the reason it fails is because propagating error backwards over time for longer time steps, more than 10 or 15, basically the gradient becomes too close to zero and you cannot make much of the weight updates. Hence, uh, the LSTM or the long short term memory recurrent neural networks were proposed. So the LSTM is a recurrent neural network. So it could be seen as a, something that comes under recurrent neural network. It's a special type of recurrent neural network designed to address the vanishing gradient problem. And the way it is done is to, uh, the way it has done, 
the authors have proposed uh, basically memory cells and gates in the hidden layers and they are a way they are used to basically capture um, uh, the structure in memory better so they can uh, inf uh, process time variant information better so uh, these LSTM networks they have shown to work for more than 1000 times steps so uh, when compared to simple recurrent neural network of only they can only work with 10 or 15 time steps so this makes them very popular for a lot of applications so you would not have if you were doing some if you had a language model where you had some sort of uh, analysis of uh, certain paragraphs so if your paragraph was very large uh, and you were basically labeling a paragraph by topic if you have paragraphs labeled by topic if your paragraph is very large if the paragraph has more than 50 words or more than 100 words then basically um, simple uh, recurrent neural network would not be able to take care of it but a simple recurrent neural network mostly would be able to work with twitter tweets because they have they, they have a limit so uh, LSTM for language modeling, basically you could, um, in the area of language modeling, because we know that neural networks or statistical models generally, they work with data that is uh, real numbers or discrete uh, data sets, right? But in languages, we know that they are express characters. So we need to basically convert those characters into some sort of uh, representation. And uh, uh, th this what we see here is a very simple uh, language model and it is a LSTM for language modeling and here basically the representation is not explicitly shown oh you can we can see the explicit the representation is explicitly shown with one hot encoded uh, vector and basically it's a um, uh, uh, input set of input characters are given and basically the target characters are given and the goal of the neural network is to see the uh, mapping from the input to the output and you will have a uh, back propagation through time based algorithm which will be training it. So uh, that's basically the background of a recurrent neural network and LSTM models and these LSTM models are not can be used to basically predict future words such as when we are typing in uh, um, se several apps these days in LinkedIn. I don't recall if we are doing it in LinkedIn, but in a number of apps, we, type, we keep on typing and they keep on help, helping us to correct our um, spelling as we type or uh, propose or predict what are the future words that can be used while we are typing. And those things can be done with the LSTM model. And they are usually trained on a very large corpus of text and based on uh, user behavior, it can take uh, current information and predict what are the uh, future words in a sentence that we are trying to write. So uh, what are transformers? So transformer is a extended or special type of uh, LSTM model. And uh, it uh, basically, uh, takes the concept uh, mechanism of uh, attention as in cognitive attention when we give attention to specific words in a paragraph we do not memorize entire paragraph when we are trying to remember it we will usually have attention to specific words in a paragraph and that basically then we relate it to some uh, meaning right and that basically idea is used by LST uh, transformers and transformer is a very complex architecture of um, somewhat stacked LSTM in an encoder decoder uh, framework. And uh, when we compare to traditional LSTMs, transformers do not require data to be processed in a sequential order since the attention operator operation provides context for any position in the input sequence. So that's a major advantage of uh, transformer networks uh, over LSTMs. And uh, we can see here that we have a overview of our transformer network with uh, 
uh, showing attention mechanisms and different uh, operations. And uh, essentially, these transformer networks are very large. You have you uh, very simple versions of it. Usually, you will end up with a couple of million parameters for even for small data sets. So uh, then moving on, we have BERT. And the T in BERT is basically the transformer. And BERT, it is developed by Google. It is uh, basically a transformer, uh, which is uh, pre-trained on a very large corpus data, language data set for language tasks. And it's basically uh, the Part of it is open for free use, and the uh, some parts are not open for free use. So in our project, we are using uh, in BERT, we are using uh, the BERT base, which is uh, available as uh, for free use. The idea is basically that BERT is using, it's pre-trained on a very large corpus with 800 million words, uh, English Wikipedia with uh, two, hundred and two thousand five hundred uh, million words uh, respectively for the BERT base and BERT large and different uh, embeddings are used if you do not use BERT then there are other ways to train LSTMs you need to use language embeddings meaning that you uh, convert uh, your sentences into a vector of real numbers in some of the language embedding uh, method, what to work and glove. And they basically provide uh, context-free models uh, to generate a single word embedding for each word. And compared to them, BERT takes into account the context of each occurrence of a given word, which makes BERT as one of the best language models. And because it is trained by such a large uh, corpus, it has shown to be better than LSTM and transformers on their own. And so the, the great part of BERT is that the limitation is that it has millions of parameters. But the great part is that you do not have to train those millions of parameters yourself. You have BERT available. Uh, online the trained model is available online all you need to do is download that trained model and then you basically kind of tailor you can tailor make it to suit your needs so you can have your data set perhaps that data set may not be available or used in the original but data for training so you basically are uh, uh, fine-tuning your BERT model with a new data set. You can do that. So um, moving on, uh, as, as you can see here in the, in the literature, in, in many websites these days, the way they describe BERT uh, with uh, uh, Sesame Street, you know, they're the character BERT there. So basically um, a lot of websites and uh, these days, some papers, they also put a, a cartoon character BERT to show BERT. But that is all about a, a very fast, uh, um, rough overview about language models with LSTMs, transformers, BERT, and uh, major problems such as uh, sentiment analysis and topic modeling. And now, basically, we discuss some of the key applications of these that I have uh, been active in. So these applications, actually, uh, when I entered uh, the School of Mathematics and Statistics, I had no knowledge about uh, language modeling. And I did not do any work on language modeling before. So this is all the these applications are more planned right at the School of uh, Mathematics and Statistics in my office and home. And I would say this is a product of UNSW. and. Uh, Otherwise, my other research areas such as geoscientific models, um, uh, neuroevolution, uh, Bayesian neural networks, those are some of the things that I came to UNSW with. But this is something that is unique uh, to UNSW. Um, so the first project is uh, looking at using those language models in understanding the US general elections. 
So we know about this uh, quite well because uh, the media was uh, very active in uh, promoting uh, the elections and there were very much a lot of fierce uh, debates uh, between uh, Trump and Biden and there were almost daily tweets by Trump back in the days and those daily tweets, uh, some of them were quite controversial and uh, they were uh, part of major discussions. So uh, there's basically the deep learning uh, in these language models, recurrent neural networks, LSTM and BERT, these things were not very prominent uh, before 2010. They were there, but they were not really the forefront of language modeling. In the last 10 years, all these uh, technologies have overtaken natural language processing. And uh, they are becoming uh, more and more prominent in um, sentiment analysis and in and, uh, and, uh, topic modeling. And Twitter is uh, very uh, prominent uh, application of these models because the reason Twitter is used widely is because Twitter has this uh, app that it allows users, researchers to download data. So all the tweets that are public, we can download it, but it's not a straightforward process. There are a lot of um, restrictions in how we download it, and we can only download it uh, um, uh, on a, a, a amount for a day, basically. So sometimes it will take us weeks to download the data. But for this project, we did not download the data. We used existing data that other people downloaded. And social media, of course, plays a major crucial role in shaping the worldview during election campaigns. And there have been a lot of discussions about controlling social media during elections, uh, probably banning even them during elections because it can uh, be used as a tool of proper political propaganda as well. And in the US, we have seen that it led to uh, violent riots, uh, the capital riots during the 2020 presidential uh, campaigns. So uh, there has been previous research that already there that shows that understanding behavior in terms of sentiments during elections can give us some indication of the election outcome. And uh, I have already talked about the background that basically it was a very intense competition between uh, Biden and Trump and uh, there were political unrests. And we also note that uh, President Donald Trump, back then he was president, and he was banned by Twitter for some of the comments he made. So uh, basically we present a framework for sentiment analysis where the state of art language models to understand public behavior during elections. And uh, in the paper, we show results for both BERT and LSDM based language models for sentiment analysis. <clears throat> the thing, uh, what are we using? So basically BERT already comes pre-trained and it already has uh, sentiment analysis uh, the power to uh, have uh, perform sentiment analysis but we basically take the BERT model and then we again train it or fine-tune it with the IMDB database which has it's quite a large database and it has polarity scores between one and minus one indicating positive and negative sentiments and uh, basically we investigate in this uh, paper that if sentiment analysis from social media can help in modeling and understanding voter behavior during elections but this is basically the overview uh, we have the BART uh, transformer and uh, we have the LSTM language model and uh, we have the tweets there's pre-processing and cleaning and a lot of effort was done made uh, for pre-processing and cleaning and then we get the sentiment polarity scores and analysis of 
real-time series data with sentiments, and then we do state-wise comparison between final results. Uh, that means the final results of the elections and the overall sentiments. So the tweets, basically, the source of tweets, you can see that there's a lot of tweets um, all around the world. In particular, major sources are uh, in uh, Europe, US, and also in India. Uh, over the last uh, few years, actually, India Twitter users have been exponentially growing because the number of internet users in India are now around 750 million, and they are next to China, around 900 million. But uh, China is uh, having, uh, we all know that they are not open to social media from uh, America with Facebook and Twitter ban. So that's why we don't see much from there, but we still see some dots there. Maybe it is uh, because uh, they may be using VPN and so. Right, so uh, the problem with the data is that we found that there's a lot of uh, missing values. And what we did was we took, we discarded the data from the rest of the world. We were only interested in what American voters think about Biden and Trump. We do not care about what the rest of the world does because we wanted to see if it can help us in somehow estimating or predicting something about the how the states are going to perform. So uh, with the data, basically, comes all this uh, information and in such as state codes, which continent, city. So this kind of helped us to get uh, those uh, users that are not in US. And uh, here, basically, what we see is uh, uh, the data sets, uh, the number of tweets uh, that have the terms Trump and Biden and how they basically increase over time till 11th uh, 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 um, till uh, November, basically. And um, basically the data set so we note that the model is uh, there and it is using the imdb data set the model on its own it does not know anything about the elections or anything about the twitter data sets it's it's basically bird plus imdb data set trained model which knows which will give polarity scores if you give it even uh, some made up data or made up tweet but we are then presenting it with tweet, tweets from US elections relating to uh, Trump and Biden. And basically the tweets, we do uh, get the bigrams and trigrams to see what are the, some of the key terms expressed. Uh, and we see Joe Biden, of course, in the Biden related tweets is the most, but we have other things uh, expressed uh as well such as vice president president united and then we have trigrams on the bottom and uh, then for trump we have uh, anti-trump uh, as well election day and others and donald trump and in uh, surprisingly in the in both of them yes uh, it's kind of not a surprise because they are opposing to each other so people have been tweeting about them so we have see joe biden is next to trump so uh, after basically modeling, we uh, see scores, the predictions state-wise. And taking the state-wise predictions, the polarity, the positive and the negative towards each of those candidates, we basically then uh, labeled as, uh, uh, came to a decision where in which state which candidate will win and which are the states where uh, it's contentious. Contentious is basically it's not sure which uh, uh, candidate will win because uh, uh, the polarity scores are very close. So um, what uh, basically we found is uh, we also compared the BART model with the LSTM model. And the LSTM model was not a pre-trained model. 
it was just trained from the IMDB data set. And here in the LSTM model, what we see is that a lot of states are shown as states, whereas in the BART model, we, sorry, um, in the BART model, we find that uh, the BART model is giving a very much close uh, results to when you compare to the actual results. Whereas if you compare the LSTM model, basically we see that uh, it's basically over predicting contentious states. So this is basically our final result and there are other results which are basically part of the paper. Is everything okay? Can I continue? Yeah, all good, right? Right. So the thing is, you can see that we analyzed only uh, 1.2 million tweets associated with the US presidential elections. Uh, the problem was like more than 90% of the tweets basically were not giving their user location. And that basically is a huge problem for this kind of analysis because people do not want to express where they are and uh, we found that uh, given mod we but a model basically indicated that biden had but better chance of winning and given more data and geographical information we think that sentiment analysis can be helpful in elections moving on uh, uh, we apply a similar model but model for sentiment analysis and we see the visualization of the COVID, uh, of the coronavirus, and we know that the coronavirus, uh, there was a lot of hurdles, there were lockdowns, and there was a huge change in a very short time, and it was known or labeled as a catastrophic event. And a lot of psychological issues, depression and social changes, lack of employment, and so on. And uh, Hence, basically, I thought that it would be interesting to see what type of sentiments, what are people writing on social media. And this project uh, began towards the towards uh, November of last year. So uh, we looked for some data sets and uh, present and hence we present uh, using the existing data sets. Uh, we present uh, LSTM and BERT uh, language models and see how my concern was more about as the number of cases rose in, so the country that was selected was India. The reason that I selected India was that there was not much done for the case of India in uh, COVID-19 modeling, less work was done compared to other parts of the world. And uh, the other thing is that India had a very, had a single peak of cases. And uh, that was the peak was, uh, and basically that kind of made me ask uh, uh, the research questions, uh, motivated me to ask the research questions that uh, given a single peak, how do people express themselves? Basically, the, our framework uses multi-level sentiment classification. So uh, multi-level, hence, in uh, here is where you have one tweet can have uh, two different sentiments or three different sentiments. That means a tweet can be uh, sad, pessimistic, and anxious, right? So that is uh, defined as multi-level classification. So the data set, although we use both LSTM and BERT, here the data set for training was different. The data I set for training was human level sentiments from 10,000 tweets worldwide by 50 experts. And that is a published data set. And we used the, and that there were 10 sentiments that were, were in the training data set. And uh, we basically um, applied uh, that, uh, uh, the BERT model, we trained it with the sentiments uh, which were handleable, and um, also the LSTM model. And here, what we see here is uh, looking at then 
then after training we then get the data from india and those the twitter data set was also published but not labeled so we get the data set from india and we see we do some data analysis and we see that over the months this is the part which motivated me to do this work you can see that there's a single peak basically this is the peak around september and then the cases lower after that so that's the blue is the number of cases and the red is the number of tweets that were expressed about COVID-19. So you can see that a time comes when people basically stopped expressing that much. And that is when the peak was reached somewhat then. And what were the top biograms? Uh, coronavirus. And we have folded hand. Folded hand also refers to namaste or please. And uh, these were basically expressed folded hand was more of the emoji that was expressed but we converted the emoji to to text and uh, the top try grams uh, also the first one is the deck hand index pointing is uh, emoji and uh, the feisty a joy and all these expressions so some of them are combinations of emojis and these are some of the challenges in language modeling so look we are looking at uh, the data set, uh, the hand labeled uh, data set for training, what are the two major sentiments that were expressed? So, uh, for example, in the training data set, we have optimistic, and the, the outlier here is an official report, which is not a human sentiment, but it was just a present in the training data. So, we used it because we thought that it will be useful as uh, one of the classes. We can see here that. In the training data set, for example, uh, people are optimistic when they see official reports and then basically, and they are, a lot of the time, they are optimistic and joking, for example, right? They are optimistic and joking. And of course, they will be very, um, the times when they are optimistic and empathetic is they are optimistic is so, pessimistic so we are looking at a combination of two sentiments and basically we took that data set we trained the model and then we basically took the data from india and then we uh, look at optimistic and joking optimistic and thankful and this is for the entire duration of about um uh six months from um, march or april to september something like that the data and these were some of the predictions we in the in the predictions for the entire data set we see that the number of uh, sentiments uh, multiple levels or multiple sentiments expressed at once where for two sentiments expressed were for less than 40000 tweets and three sentiments were very rare and um, sometimes there were no sentiments expressed so and where's one sentiment then this is what the BERT and the LSTM language models showed us in the paper basically I show a comparison of LSTM and BERT predictions as well and they are not that different uh, they are close and this is the part that really drove me and uh, I find this is one of the key results uh, basically that over time, what are the key uh, sentiments that were expressed? So what we see here is that joking and optimistic are the two sentiments that were most expressed as the COVID cases rose. Note that the peak was reached around September, but in a September, the number of sentiments expressed were quite low uh, generally, but uh, these day, uh, months, June to july august people were expressing a lot and they were joking and optimistic mostly so and uh, other findings is that optimistic annoyed and joking tweets mostly dominated the monthly tweets with much lower number of negative sentiments expressed so generally we found that people were very much optimistic but they were also a bit annoyed uh, according to some of the sen uh, sentiments 
and minority of them were thankful. In terms of the annoyed uh, sentiments and tweets, my, mostly were either surprised or joking. These predictions generally indicate that although the majority have been optimistic, a significant group of the population has been annoyed towards the way the pandemic was handled by the authorities. And this is uh, not surprising. So uh, moving on to the third project, I know I'm running out of time. Basically, the idea was to bring these models and let's study something different. So this is you now going into humanities, philosophy of religion, and uh, in a completely different area. And uh, where there's some work done on analysis of Hindu texts. And uh, basically, the what we see here uh, is uh, an event from around 5,200 years ago which is the Mahabharata war in India, where we have uh, Arjuna, Lord Arjuna, who is known as the avatar of, uh, so, uh, of um, Vishnu. And we have um, Arjuna, who is the warrior, who is the key warrior in the war. And basically the text that we are interested in is the Bhagavad Gita, which basically there's a bigger text known as the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita is like a chapter from the Mahabharata. If you print out the Bhagavad Gita, it's not that long. It's around 50 pages, right? So, but what is the Bhagavad Gita and why is this war important? Because this is a war where two family member uh, sides of a family, they go on to war and they are fighting for their rights to lead uh, or rights to the throne. And basically Arjuna here, uh, uh, before the war begins, he is like not sure if he should go to war or not because on the opposite side, he has seen that his family members are there, his cousins are there, his gurus are there and he has to fight them and he has to kill them in order to win the war. So he lays down his bow and then he starts talking to Arjuna, uh, to, to Krishna. So Arjuna starts asking, uh, Krishna a set of questions and the questions he asks, the answers he gives, that's basically the Bhagavad Gita. And it is like, should he go to the world, have this war or not? So from the Bhagavad Gita, we have two key, uh, some key concepts which are uh, mentioned uh, quite a lot in our everyday language. For example, gurus, dharma, the concept of karma and uh, selfless action. Oh, and yoga, some of these terms are from the text, the Bhagavad Gita. And it, in the last two centuries, the Bhagavad Gita, it is believed to be a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, but this conversation was sung for millenniums and it was only written uh, uh, um, around, some scholars say, between 2500 to 3500 years ago right so and it was written in um, sanskrit and uh, basically for the last couple of thousand years this text has been translated mostly to hindi and indian languages but in the last two or three hundred years it has been translated to german uh, european languages and a lot of other languages so uh, the thing is, the problem is because it's been translated so much and has gained a lot of attention by Western scholars and academics worldwide, there's a number of different translations and which translations are valid, what can be uh, the, uh, what studies are there about the difference in the translations. There are a number of studies. And what I'm bringing to this is that we use this BERT and LSTM language models to understand the differences in the translations, both in terms of semantics and uh, uh, sentiments. So the three translations that I am looking at are basically one by Mahatma Gandhi and Iknath Ishwaran and Shri Purua Hitswami. And as you can see the dates of the translation, there's a huge uh, gap and basically because of the gap the type of expressions in the translations have changed as well and 
the thing is that what we need to say what i need to emphasize here as well is bhagavad gita the term itself means bhagavad or bhagwan it means the enlightened one or it can also mean god gita means song and it literally translates as song of the divine or song of god and god here is krishna and uh, the way it's written in sanskrit and also the hindi translations that i know of are all poems that you can sing and they are rhyming and people have memorized them and they can sing and the major problem is that with poetry when you translate it a lot of people have different uh, viewpoints and the, the another problem here is that this is not just poetry even the modern poems like uh, if you have english poems written now i mean i am a poet myself and i write in english and then i have seen google translate and comparing and then it translates to hindi then i read it sometimes you know uh, a lot of times it doesn't really get what i'm trying to say but it's interesting and basically uh, this is a, a text that is also the forefront of hinduism and it is uh, equivalent to the bible for christians for hindus the bhagavad gita is the key text that has the same respect as the bible so uh, looking at some uh, verses from the bhagavad gita the two translations one shri purohit swami and one we have by mahatma gandhi we see that on top uh, it's talking uh, saying it is desire it is aversion born of passion desire consumes and corrupts everything it is man's greatest enemy whereas 37 on the bottom it is lust it is wrath born of the guna rajas so guna uh, features rajas is type of uh, uh, mental expression uh, basically this is sanskrit so in this translation, some of the key terms which the authors thought are not easy to translate into English, they kept this, uh, Mahatma Gandhi kept the um, Sanskrit, whereas uh, the uh, Shri Prabhupada Swami, he doesn't do that. He forcefully translates it. So as fire is obscured by smoke and mirror by death, the embryo is the Armenian. So is the knowledge obscured by this. Knowledge is obscured, O Panteya, by this eternal enemy and so on. Here basically saying something similar, but here what I want to highlight is saying, oh Arjuna. So basically Arjuna also has a number of different names and some translators use Arjuna, some use Kontaya. So there are all these uh, different text pre-processing we had to do to bring them into one uh, page uh, so that they speak the same language and basically the text processing we had to change the archaic words we had to change the name so that's in the same name same domain and basically we use uh, bird and we are using bird for the sentiment analysis and also and we are using other methods for semantic analysis and so on we look at verse similarity by word embedding models word to vec and so on and basically we have the original and the transformed sentence this is just text processing where we are changing things uh pre-processing and after that what we did is i took advantage there in the literature there's no there's not much data where we have people hand labeling sentiments you know so and this was great. The COVID uh, send wave data set where 10,000 tweets were hand labeled by 50 experts. I saw that as an opportunity. And basically, I thought that let's basically use this not for just COVID research, but uh, for understanding the language text. Because the I, I am assuming that the key, yes, we can assume that the key sentiments, either it's expressed through Twitter or through other texts, when people see sentiments, uh, I mean, the, the, the sentiments would be same, right? So, or similar. So the, the idea is basically looking at chapter by, so there are 18 chapters in the Bhagavad Gita, 700 verses. So it's not a long uh, text. You can print it in 50 pages, as I said earlier. Uh, and we can see that in chapter by chapter, we see the different authors basically here are expressing the sentiments uh, different chapters have 
different uh, counts of the sentiments basically it's not going to be exactly the same and it's quite obvious because we have seen some examples of the two different authors expressing things but we have again cleaned that and uh, the other thing is and processed it but still we see that there are these differences in the sentiments the other thing is the 10 optimistic and pessimistic bigrams we see uh, so the optimistic uh, ones are the supreme goal a creature selfless service pleasure pain attain supreme uh, self selfish attachments spiritual wisdom on the other side uh, you know time death uh, home world nature divine one major part is the sons of dhritarashtra which it kind of somehow saw it as pessimistic which is important because dhritarashtra is seen as the sons are the on the opposing side of the war and they are the people causing trouble and that the, uh, there is some mention of them and somehow the model has uh, picked that quite well then moving on the final project i'll just summarize that we are applying actually in this project uh, we are yet to do the semantic analysis so we'll do a semantic analysis and have similar results like this and we'll have, show statistics and we'll also have chapter by chapter work the uh, verse by verse semantic and syn syn sentiment analysis and we will present that all in the paper and then moving on basically uh, there's the Upanishads which is known as the oldest one of the oldest uh, philosophical texts in the world and basically is composed took more than a thousand years of compositions composition where basically seekers were going to the gurus and gurus were basically some kind of very general questions their seekers were asking they say guru namaste what is the meaning of life and the guru will say something and they basically noted it down so this is basically the upanishads and what we are trying to do is see what is the mapping of the upanishads in comparison to the Bhagavad Gita. So the Upanishads, similar to the Bhagavad Gita, they are somewhat divine text, somewhat holy text for the Hindus. But the Bhagavad Gita has uh, is prominent in the West, and so is the Upanishads. So, for example, we have some key uh, author, uh, key scientists here, and Carl Gustav Jung, of course um psychologist um and uh, they basically wrote some studied the Upanishads and Niels Bohr is saying I go to the Upanishads to ask questions the rest I'm running out of time but uh, they are very pro pro have been very prominent in the west so some of the things uh, famous one of the my favorite famous verse on the Upanishad is you are what your deep driving desire is as your desire is so is your will as your will is so is your deed as your deed is, so is your destiny. And uh, the rest, are, the other one is knowledge is twofold, higher and lower, the study of the Vedas, linguistics, rituals, astronomy, and the soul uh, arts can be seen as lower knowledge. The higher is that which leads to self-realization. So uh, we basically have this whole framework where we want to compare the topics of the Upanishads with the Bhagavad Gita because it is known by Hindu philosophers or even Western philosophers and academics studying Hinduism. They say that Bhagavad Gita summarizes the Upanishads in the rest of the Hindu text and it is the center of the text. So we want to see what type of topics are mapping between the Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads. And we have UMAP and PCA embeddings we did. And we're looking at the topics and yet we have to show the results from Bert and others but some of the topics have been, and we have some kind of similarity score between them and some ID. And basically the Upanishads that we are looking at are only 12 major Upanishads, which are so, but uh, there are actually 108 Upanishads. So we are going to further apply these things to the 108 Upanishads and see the mapping and sentiment analysis as well. So uh, what are some of the limitations and challenges in general? As I said, availability of data and geo-information for the Twitter kind of analysis. And uh, interpretation of conversational expressions and language. Interpretation of poetry, songs translated from ancient languages. Limitation of language modeling for 
Indian languages. So there's, we don't have bar, much work with BART and Sanskrit, BART and Hindi, it's upcoming. So these are some uh, limitations that can be addressed and collaboration with uh, academics in hearts or humanities, lack of funding for humanities research in Australia and recognition of interdisciplinary humanities research by scientific journals. So it will be a question for me, where do we submit this research? And then uh, personally for me, after publishing some of these things and also talking about it, being misrepresented as a priest or theological when studying philosophy of religion. My interest is philosophy of religion. Uh, so uh, future work we are going to apply. Uh, we are in the process of applying these BERT model, models to anti-vexa sentiments uh, in Twitter in collaboration with CSIRO uh, and the language models for understanding and analysis of patient experience in Australian hospitals. We are acquiring data, topic model, modeling and evolution of ancient poetry and songs, not the Bhagavad Gita, but others. It could be English poems as well and political biasness in media reporting. And finally, which I did not write is also, uh, you know, awareness of climate change and related topics in Twitter. What sentiments are people expressing? And I would like to uh, say thanks to Ashwin, Mukul, Shweta and Venkatesh. These are the guys, my groups for group for uh, philosophy of religion and uh, uh, language modeling. And Roger is a master student uh, acquiring hospital data. Kathy is a master student doing the anti-vexa project uh, with Prof. Sheshadri Vasan from Saibu. And special thanks to Indian Institute of Technology. The top, top ones are the papers for sentiment analysis and uh, topic modeling, uh, sorry, US modeling, election modeling already published. The bottom two will uh, come by January. I'll place them in archive by January, at most by February. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, thanks. Sorry for being late. Uh, all these projects uh, and uh, software, all the papers basically have a GitHub repo and everything is there. And a lot, all the processing of the text, the data will be also published along with the models and the results. Thank you so much. Your questions. Thanks, Arit. That was great. Uh, many different stories and um, different topics. Um, so we can take a bit of time to um, for some questions. So if anyone has some, uh, right? There, there's one maybe to start from Stefan in the in the chat. Are biograms the word or token in pairs in a sentence or tweet the transformer assigns most attention to in more order to make a sentiment uh, prediction? Uh, no, actually, we do not give them uh, the models biograms and trigrams. The biograms and trigrams were just used for data analysis and just for visualization purpose. It's not really part of the model. The model is supposed to get better information than biograms and trigrams with help of BERT and LSTM architecture to make the sentiment prediction. Okay, thanks, Pia, and thanks, Jan, and Frank. Any other questions? Um, maybe while um, anyone, or oh, Stefan, you're muted, you want to? Clarify or say something? Oh, yeah. Um, I did. Uh, sorry, I can't. I don't think I can share my video. Uh, some sort of permissions issue. But um, just following up from that question, um, it is a transformer in the end, right? And so I'm just wondering if it is possible to extract the attention mechanism information. So surely certain mm. words in the tweets or sentences would be given assigned more attention to. And I'm wondering if um, once we make a prediction, we can extract that sort of information as well uh, in order to increase the interpretability of the model itself. Uh, that's a wonderful comment. Uh, I, I would really uh, take that into consideration and improve the, our next coming papers. If we, we talked to, if I presented this earlier, probably I would have 
published uh, that result. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks. I think Jan has also a question. Thanks. Hi, Jan. Yeah, um, allow. Sorry. Uh, Jan, you're muted now. Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted, but um, great talk. Uh, so what one, I guess I have a few questions, but one, I guess, is what do you think about the issue of the representativeness of the discussions on Twitter versus the representative versus the population as a whole? Um, is that something that you have a ideas about how to address or do you think that's very diff it's sort of sep completely separate issue to what you're doing in terms of public sentiment so like as in does yes. does twitter subsample a certain group of people like maybe particularly uh politically active or high high information content people level people do you have thoughts about that um, yes, uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, the yes, uh, the thing is, our model is not l l looking at uh, what tweets are or uh, posts are more prominent than others, but that happens, right? We see in LinkedIn or Twitter, some of them go viral, but uh, the way we are looking at the data, we are not looking at uh, that information at all. So basically, we are fair in that sense. Mm. But yes, the there are major limitations, as we know, the sensor censoring problem is there, and really to have used this for something critical like election modeling, uh, it's it's not there yet. Probably the model. It's just that I have presented a framework, and yeah. the availability of data and the um, quality of data is a big uh, question mark. And this also applies in future projects uh, in when we dealing with Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing is that uh, less than uh, 90, uh, very small portion of uh, users actually give the ge geographic location. So let's say if we are doing another project where we want to do something similar about elections in uh, Australia, mm -hmm. unless people make their uh, location available, there's a, Unfortunately, people are more comfortable in sharing uh, some very personal things, but they find city information very personal <laughs> to share. But they would share, <laughs> they would share what they are eating. They would share, <laughs> would write something which, <laughs> which can get them fired. But they all want to share yeah, the feeling. <laughs> and and this has been a problem with me because with Cyro and Professor Vassan, we were planning on doing another project where we want to see the spread of the virus and then how how we can use Twitter for that. And in the past, it has been used, but Twitter users are becoming more and more, uh, you know, sensitive about sharing that information. And mm -hmm. I hope that in the future, somehow Twitter hears our plea and people hear our plea that in sharing your city information is very useful for geographic <laughs> data analysis, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, in in the other uh, domains, such as, uh, you know, accessing non social media information, such as uh, for building this language model, such as the religious texts, uh, or it could be not just religious texts, we could be using uh, them on other texts, we could be analyzing how our textbooks are expressing sentiments, what topics are in our textbooks. For example, some critical things. Uh, now we have uh, a huge uh, uh, discussion about representation or making uh, mathematics, uh, yeah. you know, uh, represented uh, by other yeah. uh, ethnic groups. Uh, Aboriginal uh, are Aboriginals represented in our text, you know, or yeah. in the high school yeah. or university. So those yeah. things and we can do. Those things. Yeah. And yeah. are they represented positively? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that kind of uh, yeah. stuff. Uh, probably we can do all those projects and um, uh, welcome everybody from the school uh, to be part of these things. Let me know, please. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Thanks.
Well, thanks for sharing the video. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the link, yes yeah. and there are questions about uh, birds transparency of bird as well and there are other pre-trained models coming uh, which are competing with bird and uh, so on and it's not that bird is uh, the key uh, is the end of uh, the modeling era i mean it's known as a state of the art models but these models they do not remain the state of art for long Hey, Rohit, I have I have a question that is more a uh, one, one. It's not really um, about the model, but in in some of the um, biograms that you had, at some point you had one that was I think optimistic, pessimistic, and in the optimistic you had a biogram that was um, pleasure and pain. So. Is that is that a is that a an optimistic one? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess you can go in both, right? Or like, what's what's the judgment to you to you put it there? I think that uh, that is a good catch, uh, Boris, uh, and uh, you you you. That's a critical question, and we do have to address that in our paper. And I think we need to kind of go back to the to that exact sentiment. What score was given? Probably there were maybe two, like some of the sentiments. This is multi-level classification. Then there are a couple of sentiments expressed at once, and somehow because we may have, you know, blindly grouped them as brigrams and trigrams without looking at the exact uh, other sentiment you know so what were the other sentiments so i think we need to probably redo that figure and show that uh, you know uh, somehow make sense of it we need to see why it is viewing that so uh, there have been also some cases where you know people have been optimistic and uh, you know, pessimistic kind of at the same time. Some, so those are some of the challenges that we need to really highlight, and they are some of the problems with uh, BART-based modeling. But uh, I just want to say that we are uh, point. We may be pointing a bit too many fingers at our BART model here. It's still, you know, uh, this is kind of novel in this sense that it is bringing this to humanities area although sentiment analysis and social media is not new but the thing is we may be a bit uh, harsh towards these models because if you look at multi-level sentiments i mean if we give humans generally to recognize sentiments and to recognize more than two sentiments or two sentiments at once is also a quite a hard task for humans actually so that is being done by these models and uh, so that is uh, something to think about Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, that was, that was a good point. Right? All right, I think we can we can um, uh, thank you again for for this great talk and and the good discussion that comes with it. So I'm clapping. I hope everyone is clapping as well. And uh, wish you all a wish you all a good weekend.